Um, so I, I want to make clear from what position I'm speaking. So this is not just uh, captatio benevolentia, as we'd say in German, but uh, I'm not a linguist. And, and also I want to say thank you. I feel really uh, privileged, or but definitely happy, to be in such a circle because I usually don't get to hear this kind of discussion. But I understand some part of it and I really profit from this very much. And so I want to speak more about writing practices. And then my second disclaimer is I should also admit that I am not a trained paleographer in the sense of ever having had a teacher in this area and so forth. But I got interested. So my idea is mainly in the formational history of texts, of early Chinese texts. And, and I've done this uh, for a long time just with transmitted texts, where you can do this as well, just by comparing and historical criticism and so forth. But then, of course, went into uh, this uh, new field of manuscripts. And uh, so what I want to contribute today also, it's maybe a third disclaimer, isn't any new research. So some of you know all my points, probably almost all of them, that I've made earlier somewhere. But uh, I've made them in different contexts. And I just <laughs> want to give some examples that seem to me to fit into this discussion of how we use a phonology, uh, sorry, how we use uh, paleographic sources for uh, phonology, for the reconstruction or whatever word you prefer of Old Chinese. And, um, and they're not completely random, but they're not all very neatly related. So this paper is not trying to be um, a systematic discussion you know, of something that I publish in this way. So I just want to go through a few examples. And now maybe my last disclaimer, if that is one. I'm sorry I have something in writing here, because I know what happens when I just go through my examples, and then I start to ramble and go into too much detail. So I will, for the first part, be mostly uh, following a written script here, because otherwise um, it's a time problem. <clears throat> so uh, let me start by saying that I consider it uh, one of the strong points of uh, uh, the recent book, uh, Baxter Saga, uh, to include very strongly um, paleographic sources as evidence. And uh, so what I want to present is just uh, something where I make this non-training that I just described productive in the sense of being unencumbered by a lot of theories of how paleography should work or the linguistic side of it and just try to apply what seems to me to be fairly sane reasoning. <laughs> um, and, and consider certain possibilities uh, that I want to suggest how writing could have taken place and maybe even how the reading of these materials could have taken place and what that means uh, to us. So a point with which I agree very much is um, the point you make in your book that uh, the uh, manuscript characters, especially from pre-imperial times, reflect sound changes more flexibly than the more stable orthography of later periods, uh, which makes these sound changes less visible or maybe entirely invisible. You could, of course, then say in the 20th century, orthographic reform does something else, but that's obviously not what we're discussing. Um, so uh, this uh, flexibility of early orthography really makes uh, early manuscripts a very important new source for the reconstruction of Old Chinese. And, and I think that is what the book makes abundantly clear uh, with multiple really excellent examples. I'm not going there. Um, but what I want to discuss today is that the lower degree of orthographic stability also creates problems with regard to extracting phonological information uh, from the characters. I want to talk about a few aspects of early Chinese writing practice that I believe should be considered as possibilities. <laughs> They're not necessarily really firm assumptions that I have. And I think that will become clear when I get to the examples. So I don't know if my title, Limitations to the Source Value, is particularly good, but um, let's just present what I really want to talk about it and then see if it fits. Uh, so um, let's first come to what I think are excellent examples in, in your book uh, of uh, how sound change is reflected in uh, different orthographies. And just to save time, I won't say anything about it. They just convinced me <laughs> based on uh, the evidence I know. And um, I want to come to uh, another point where I think that not all changes of, um, sorry, changing or varying phonophorics in characters uh, are as clear cut. So, and you know, you've already prepared a lot of ground here. Um, and I want to go to the example of Warring States characters used to write the words sung, bereavement, mourning, or sung, to lose, 
and show that changes in phonophoric character components may be unrelated to sound changes and occur for more complicated reasons. Um, getting phonetic information for manuscript characters involves, just to be a bit more systematic, I hope, I think three major activities. First is to identify the character components. Second, to identify the functions of these components uh, that I would roughly distinguish in either phonetic or semantic or distinctive that is usually disambiguating. So some components really play no semantic or phonetic role. And, and third, if that function is phonetic, then uh, to determine what this phonetic value is. Um, so let me begin with this uh, example that I just mentioned. So according to Hu Shen, the character is a combination of the phonetic wang written under the, the signific uh, ku to cry wail. Excavated manuscripts and inscriptions, however, do not confirm this. So I'm showing another uh, character here because this will turn out to be the actual phonetic. Um, so these uh, excavated uh, inscriptions and manuscripts do not confirm this. In fact, the word was written in oracle bone inscriptions with the character sung for mulberry tree, to which several distinctive ko were added to uh, show it's not the mulberry tree. Um, that uh, the character stands for. Then beginning in early Zhou inscriptions, the character is simplified by reducing the complexity of the upper part of the tree graph to a form that now typically looks like the graph for elbows, so we're back there, <laughs> combined with a varying number of co-elements. This makes the resemblance to the character for mulberry tree less obvious and may have affected recognition of the phonetic value. To balance this, I believe new graphs were incorporated into the character. Bronze inscriptions show the graph uh, Wang merged with the upper part of the tree character, or just the tree. I don't want to be too precise about what is the upper or lower part of the tree. And the presence of this phonetic is understood as evidence of a label initial M in uh, Baxter 92, and I think continued in your book, if I understand that right. And that's really where I have my question if there's another way of uh, looking at the paleographic evidence, uh, so, um, which is a bit complicated since the earliest characters for Sang do not have the phonetic one, and many of the later forms also do not have this element either. Uh, so let me go to this. Um, some of the bronze forms vary the original distinctive ko and instead use a foot or a combination of foot and sky corresponding to modern character Zo, which makes some sense as a semantic component but not phonetic. This already raises the question of whether the function of Wang in the other character forms is purely phonetic or maybe semantic or both. According to my somewhat cursory survey, even the majority of Zhang forms, here they come, do not have the component Wang but augment the abbreviated mulberry tree graph at the bottom by either the tree component uh, or the character for the word si to die. So obviously, um, uh, at least in the case of si here, nothing phonetic. And sometimes the right part of the si may be missing, and I think that's what in your books reflected as it could be dai. Um, um, just the left part of si. Um, mu, interestingly, of course, is not the phonetic value of mu that plays a role, but I would still consider the addition of the mu component as phonetic in function because it reinforces the recognition of Sang, the original <coughs> phonetic. <coughs> and, and then some have one, and some have a combination. <coughs> OK, uh, let me see where I was. Um, the, so again, the oldest character forms for the word Sang to lose. Wait a minute, I have another one, by the way. I should show this one. Because this is also mentioned, because that is what paleographers sort of list here, at least some, and I don't know where in the Baxter Saga book the information was from, as actually Mang with the Cao Zetao. But I don't believe that. It's uh, at the left edge of the bamboo slip, and it's actually the same as this one, only there wasn't space to turn the elbow. I believe that explains uh, more successfully what the identity of these graphs are, namely, it's again just the elbow with merged with a Wang character. And uh, yeah, and interestingly, this is just the one manuscript that I worked on a bit 
more in, in depth, um, in Gifumo. And here you can see where, uh, and I've really given this some thought, where I don't believe there's a, a change of scribal hand. And you see, sometimes you see a development of how a character is written. There's a very nice uh, example from Guardian, where in the same manuscript three uh, successive slips they have. They use four co-elements and the next one Sang uses three and then the next one only two. So, and th this is of course something we look at in writing practice, you abbreviate because, you, you know, there's no point in writing all these uh, forms apparently. And here there's no such s developments and I find this significant. So you can see they write this form with the full tree here uh, recognize, uh, helping us recognize the Sang. Then they switch to uh, the elbow, maybe with the Wang element in it, I cannot be sure, and then the Si below, but then they switch back to the tree and so forth. There doesn't really seem to be a particular rationale behind this, it's just what a scribe does. And I think that's a significant point for me to uh, emphasize, that uh, if we don't stay aware of this flexibility of that someone just does something to make it work somehow, we might uh, sometimes overinterpret uh, certain graphic forms that we look at. Okay, to sum up, oldest character forms of Sang to lose do not contain one. Django forms predominantly rely on the mulberry tree part of the character as phonophoric. That is a syllable that has no labial initial. This raises the question of whether the use of Wang in some characters was, not, uh, was maybe for its semantic value, just like the graphs Si and Zhou in other forms. If so, then the very assumption that Wang is phonophoric in the character for Sang to lose may be a misunderstanding that occurred at a later time, closer to that of Xu Shen, when the mulberry tree component went entirely unrecognized, when its abbreviated form was mistaken for Ku to cry, Wang was then assumed to be the phonetic. Once this understanding of the graph had taken hold, this would have been motivation enough to discontinue the use of the tree component and to favor the Wang graph over Si to die, which did not have Si, I mean, the advantage of a phonetic connection. In such a circumstance, it seems possible to me that the word Sang Sang never had a labial initial unless there is another type of evidence for that sound that I'm not aware of, and this is really where my competence just leaves me. <laughs> but, so purely from the paleographic evidence, I'd say it's uh, unsure. I've used this example to demonstrate that the identification of the phonophoric can be difficult as first, the writing system itself was not yet stabilized, that is, alternative character forms coexisted that allow different interpretations of the function of character components and make correct identification of the phonophoric problematic. Second, even where the writing system clearly prescribed or at least favored a certain character for a certain word, the way the graphs were written in practice created ambiguities, which again make the identification of the phonophoric difficult. And a third question is worth asking, how consistently did the writers, I'm avoiding scribe here and we tried scripteur for a long time in English. <laughs> it's just not really practical. So uh, let's, let me just say the writer, not in the sense of uh, writer of a novel. The writers and readers in early China, how consistently did they associate certain phonetic values with certain graphs? How important was this identification to their reading practice and what guided a scribe's or copyist's actual representation of a word? So uh, here I want to go to another case that I find interesting, the sentence final particle in Qin and Han manuscripts. And uh, what I have to say about this is based on Unishi Katsuya's uh, work, who has shown that the two characters indeed stand for two different, albeit uh, synonymous words, yi and ye, rather than both for the word ye, as earlier transcriptions suggest. So uh, most of you may know that uh, you found this e character and then People give a year behind that in, in the 70s, Mao and Dui transcriptions and so forth. But of course, they're not claiming anything. They're just not being clear. They're not saying we assume it stands for the word year, but it certainly creates this impression. Maybe they just want to give us a semantic hint or so. But anyway, it's, it's a fact for the users of these transcriptions. So uh, Onishi identifies the particle E as a feature of the language of Qin corresponding to the particle Ye that was used in the East and in Chu. His study of the distribution of the characters shows that after the establishment of the empire, the Qin tried to enforce the use of the E particle, especially in administrative documents, and at the end of Qin and earlier Han, uh, it begins to disappear again. 
A manuscript that I have studied in some detail, the so-called Lao Tzu B manuscript from Ma Wang Dui, starts out using the particle E uniformly for the first 13 times that such a sentence final particle is used. And all these instances occur in the first 17 columns of a manuscript of altogether 252 columns. Until this point, not a single year appears. And in the same column 17 then, after three instances of E, the use of the particle year begins and continues without a single recurrence of E for the rest of the manuscripts, altogether about 350 times. So the function of both particles is clear enough. They appear to be completely synonymous, but phonetically completely unrelated. Going by the writing system, we clearly have to read different final particles within the same passage of the same text, Yun Zheng, where it changes. Written by the same scribe who commanded an excellent calli calligraphic skill. The interesting question to me is, to what extent this scribe considered the two characters as exchangeable? Did he grudgingly write the cumbersome E with many strokes, because he was required to, but would nevertheless have pronounced the sentences as <coughs> ending in Ye, in his region? Soon enough, the scribe gave up and wrote the character which he was apparently used to, namely Ye, and which was also quicker to write. Likewise, would a reader of this passage at the time of very similar sentences have read E first and then Ye? Or would most people have read such an obvious function word the way they were used to, whatever the character was? For example, a reader who believed that Ye, uh, sorry, E represented a higher level of style or political correctness could have pronounced the manuscripts Ye characters, or the many of them, as E. Or a true patriot, I'm making this up, it's just speculation here, could have pronounced even the E characters as what to him was the proper final particle. So he would have read Ye. Just like scholars who transcribed in the 20th century, they usually always read Ye because that's what they believed it really is. Um, so, and I think that has such speculations, which they are, have a bearing on maybe how we look at, uh, at this evidence. So, um, a similar question arises when we look at characters and true manuscripts that undoubtedly stand for the numeral one. When we read these manuscripts today, there's little else we can do than pronounce each of them as E in modern Chinese, as we're used to, probably assuming that this is the word written in the manuscript text. And then, of course, the dental final uh, predecessor of today's E. In manuscripts from different true tombs and in very different texts, um, a character consisting of Yu feathers over Neng able is used for the numeral one. It is very unlikely that this character phonetically uh, represents the word e. The character suggests rather a word compatible with the phonetic uh, nung. And indeed, it could be cognate of a cognate of a Thai word for one that has a velar nasal final. And the tip uh, you know, for this article that I'm citing here, I got from Wolfgang, so thanks again. Um, and, and also, Another interesting one that tries to sort of brush this under the carpet and make it a Chinese word again, but I haven't included this information because I found it a silly article. Um, so um, in Tai Yi Sheng Shui, this complex character is used in the same passage as the single stroke one, which in this manuscript occurs only as part of the name Tai Yi, so in the single stroke. Uh, so it seems possible that the manuscript uses a local word for one that was a Thai cognate, Considering that the one-stroke character does not have a phonetic value as such, but could be, um, could be understood just as a digit used in an alphabetic writing system, it is possible that readers of the manuscript would pronounce both characters for one the same way with a nasal final. But it is also possible that they read the manuscript in a more diglossic way following a convention in which, as part of the name Tai, the word one would be pronounced with a dental final, and otherwise the word for one uh, would be used uh, just like we use different words today for uh, first lady, I uh, put this here, and uh, on the one hand, but in the school we call the head the principal, and, and no one has a problem with this. It basically both means first somehow. <clears throat> so um, there's another complicated case of variation between characters for a word or words meaning one. Here we go. Uh, other manuscripts, such as Hang Xian, use both the one-stroke character plus a combination of this stroke with the character for Ge Halbert. Despite its clear and consistent structure, transcriptions of manuscript texts identify the component 
of the character as E arrow, although it, it has an additional stroke, and it's not really this E if we look at the structure of this component. Most probably uh, because the combination is listed in the Shu Wen as the Gu Wen form for the one stroke character. As neither the halberd nor the arrow are possible phonetics for the Chinese word for one, the word written with this unfamiliar character for one may have been pronounced differently in different local languages. This leaves me uncertain about the reasons why true manuscripts have different characters for one. A phonetic difference is a possibility, but a semantic differentiation is just as possible as is a combination of both, or least likely neither. If the different characters did not indicate any phonetic or semantic distinction, they could also go back to locally uh, different orthographic conventions. The likelihood of such a scenario is usually reflected in a certain distribution of these variants. They would coincide with different hands or occur where the same hand copied texts from different sources. In the example from Tai Shengshui or Heng Xian, neither seems to be the case. But I have one example where I think I can show different source texts as the reason. The so-called Ma Wang Dui Lao Zi A manuscript, a silk scroll containing several texts copied on uh, the same silk manuscript. Actually, everything after three is a bit uncertain because there are no designations of texts in the manuscript. So it's just based on logic and how we read it. And the names are made up anyway. They're not original. And if forgot my own convention of putting an asterisk in front of them uh, to indicate that. But uh, the other texts are, uh, I mean, there are graphic distinctions, but more than six. So there are uh, what we could call paragraph breaks today. Uh, but in any case, without going to, into too much detail, what is completely unproblematic is uh, the division of these first <laughs> three. And the first one is uh, the canonical part or the guidelines part and then the explanation. So these are clear uh, differences, and in these manuscripts, uh, there are several orthographies of words that change just when the text change. So I think this is, it's reasonable to, to seek the reason in uh, someone copying from sources that come from different places or follow different orthographies. Um, so the example of the word Tsung shows uh, the precursor of the modern standard form as well as an obsolete character whose phonetic Shuang is close enough, I think, to be a mere orthographic variant, reflecting no phonetic difference or at most uh, a slight dialect variant. But a case where I see the possibility of a phonetic difference is the variation between the full form of the character for Ho and an alternative forms that were used consistently across large geographic areas and for a long span of time from the warring states into the early empire. While the word is written in its uh, full form, whenever it is used contrastively as the opposite of xian or of tian, in the frequent, on the other hand, then in the frequent collocations ran ho and ar ho, it is written with an alternative character that required fewer strokes. So typically, uh, this character is uh, the one for go hook, uh, with or without an additional bamboo or grass component. Um, these collocations occur more frequently in texts than the word in its full contrastive sense does. So we could assume maybe that's why they wrote it in a shorter form, because it just occurs too often. But still, thank you, they it, uh, do this in a very systematic fashion. So it could be a mere matter of economy of writing, but it is still possible that an economy of speaking is involved as well. I don't know if I should use such words uh, among linguists here, but as the word is also pronounced, in, I think it could be the word is pronounced in an unstressed or contracted form. But I don't know how this would play out in a linguistic sense. I just want to uh, mention the possibility because consistently this different form occurs in collocations of uh, two particular syllables. But I think it will take much more accumulated evidence for understanding early writing practices to answer this kind of question. At this point, I see uh, from the paleographic angle, we just need to do a lot of collecting and uh, also sort of coming up with some speculations that seem possible and then just collecting these as well without making a theory of it and being very sure that is what answers uh, the question. 
So a somewhat easier to understand phenomenon than the alternation of different characters is their abbreviation, which brings us back full circle to the case of Sang. Uh, in the characters uh, for Sang, the phonetic was only abbreviated, and when it became unrecognizable, it was augmented by semantic or phonetic components that help recognition. But there are cases of complete omission of the phonophoric component or its simplification beyond recognition. So sheng is an, uh, a good example. I think it was frequently written without the phonetic element. Uh, and there are lots of examples for this. In other cases, omission or just abbreviation of a graphic component was indicated by an abbreviation mark. Two horizontal strokes that were integrated into the space of the character, not placed after the character. Uh, that's an important distinction because these uh, strokes, here you can see these strokes that I mean occur in the character space here, it's not quite so clear. And as opposed to in the position where the red dot is here now, in this position you would find the ligature or repetition mark. So these need to be distinguished. But I think this is a much too little, still much too little discussed phenomenon. And it was discovered sometime in the 80s, I think, by Lin Su Qing in, I think, her doctoral dissertation. So it's, uh, the knowledge of it has been around a lot. But it seems to me that people keep it a bit to themselves and don't bring it into the discussion prominently enough for those people who do not do the paleographic work to recognize this possibility. <clears throat> so um, the characters for Qiang are typically written as Gong Bo plus Ko plus two horizontal strokes and sometimes another Li component, clearly semantic strength. Judging from the overwhelming manuscript evidence, if we were to overlook the not yet widely recognized function of these abbreviation marks, we could be misled into assuming that the left-hand part of uh, the character <coughs> is the only possible phonetic in this. <coughs> uh, the homogenic initial and identical final would support such a misconception. Xu Shen was apparently already looking at a form corresponding with the modern one and isolated the insect at the bottom right. Uh, I'm sorry. So this part here. And, uh, and then considered Hong as the phonetic. The abbreviation mark indicates a difference between the character as it is uh, written and an underlying standard in the writing system. And that is important to me. I think this is really um, a very big question that we always need to stay aware of, that uh, I'm not denying the existence of an idea of what components a character should have. Ideally, I think there was an underlying system somehow just like we have our alphabet, then, but then if we look at our actual handwriting, it differs significantly in many places, only it never creates, not never, it does create, it doesn't necessarily create a very big problem for readers, because there's so much context, just like we often overestimate the extent to which we actually hear all the individual words of a partner in conversation, and that's why we understand what they're saying. <laughs> and we were not aware of how overwhelmingly uh, big the role of context is in uh, how this conversation takes place. So, um, so this uh, difference here is indicated by the abbreviation mark between the character as it is written and an underlying standard. We either need to imagine an absent component or recognize a present component as a substitute of another more complex one. In this case, the co oh, yeah, um, is marked as an, that is marked as an abbreviation stands for the actual phonetic jiang, and there are a few characters at least to confirm this underlying identity of uh, what is mostly represented only <laughs> as co in the mouth. Uh, but uh, I think we're not always that fortunate to have these examples where the actual phonetic is still indicated to some extent. And then we're really lost in how to interpret uh, the characters. And I have much more uh, to show. <laughs> Originally, I wanted to make this talk mostly about the famous character uh, the, for Ren, I, uh, Ren Ide, Ren. And, but then Wolfgang <laughs> has written this really extensive and complex article about that, that says it all. So I don't need to repeat this. To some extent, maybe if I can use a few seconds more for this, um, there are uh, questions that go beyond just this one example, and, and maybe, uh, here, uh, I have Wolfgang's uh, article, at least I wanted to show this um, information. And uh, 
So the, the only aspect I want to point out now is that graphic components in these characters are easy to um, confuse in some cases. So um, a notorious one is uh, are these three, Ren and Shi and Gong. Usually Gong is the easiest to differentiate because often there's an additional little horizontal stroke and, and the gong should be the most curved of the three. And then she is somewhere in the middle with just one noticeable curve and then ran not much at all. But in practice, uh, in most manuscripts, these distinctions are very, very blurred. So the one example for Chiang, where it should be clearly a gong, you know, that looks like a Dunren Pang, absolutely. And, and then in the others, you can see they do a slightly better job. And then I just collected some examples, I just copied out of my own book here, is where we have, this is for Chi, 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 it's written this way. So you have, uh, luckily it is the phonetic, it seems, this Chi. So that is then the real identity, if you will, of this form. And then all the rest is missing. I mean, it's almost the entire character is missing. <laughs> you just have, but at least the phonetic is there. And then in, uh, in this one, same thing, the whole bird is missing, and then you have this shi here, uh, this stands for nian, so it seems to have ren as the real phonetic. And, and here, uh, the general assumption was, I don't know if it's just mine, because I went by the modern graph, that it has to be gong, so that's why I still list gong here, but I, I learned from your book too that shi is really phonetically compatible, so I think, no, isn't it? Shi is not phonetically compatible. No? With no, sorry, with oh, E. With I'm, I'm here in this. Yeah. yeah. So that, and, and I just looked at the modern character possibly. I, I don't know what I did at the time. And, and thought, oh, this is a gong, so that's the identity now of the uh, old graph. But maybe I just didn't get this point. So it, it, we should understand it in its old identity as sh in this one. Anyway, so there's a whole world of uh, possibility that this opens up. And, and another thing that bothers me a lot that I think, and then I think I'll wrap it up, is still very prominent in the discussion that is Xu Shen's practice, if I'm familiar enough with it, of always splitting the character in two. So there's the semantic part, and then the whole other half is given as the phonetic, and then you have to go there in the book and find again that this is a more complex one and only part of this is really the phonetic, the underlying one. And I think that blurs a lot of distinctions in how we read old graphs that uh, we don't go right away to the real core phonetic element, if you will. And then this ren yi de ren, written with shen ti de shen and xin zi pang, is really a very good example because the ren seems to be the phonetic. And then when Xu <coughs> Shen gives you tian as a phonetic, I think there is no way from the old characters how you can actually distinguish this. Um, and I didn't do a very good job to find the best examples for reasons of time, but here clearly we would, let's say these ones, see the full Shen Ti De Shen on top, but sometimes it's just written in such a contracted way that it looks like only a horizontal stroke and then it looks like Tian. So we cannot go only by what we identify purely graphically. There is this element of interpretation of this and thinking about a possible scribal practice and where they do a sloppy job or just won't be bothered. And in any way, it's neither Shen nor Tian that is the phonetic. It's in any case Ren that is contained in these, right? So I think there's a lot of uh, noise, if you will, of data if we worry about Chen and Chen and well it's all the time just the Ren component. I think that this is, uh, these other examples were just meant to uh, hear how similar abbreviations occur um, just purely graphically and this one is just another notorious case that I wanted to mention where the component that is like the modern Si without the Ko and then modern Tai uh, are really not easy to figure out. And, and the newest transcriptions of manuscripts, they want to be more precise, sometimes then write both. They give you the si and the tai, <laughs> just to be on the safe side. But I'm not sure they're both there, it's just they resemble each other. And, and they're just very gradually different forms of writing what is sort of the same thing. But I guess I promised three times to shut up. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs>